So I want to talk with you today about the dreams of a 20-year-old, which is probably where a lot of you are near, I'm guessing. Closer to 20, much closer to 20 than I am. When I was a student here at the University of Michigan in computer science and computer engineering, I can very fondly recall a day where I was walking down State Street near Nichols Arcade, and a thought came into my mind that I wanted to build a software team that would be the envy of this town. I thought to myself it would be so much fun to build an amazing company, to build a company that would be admired, to build a company that people would want to work for, to build a company that was energized. Well, I want to tell you that now at 56 years old, I appreciate much more the dreams of that 20-year-old than perhaps I did even at the time. So I want to start by simply encouraging you to hold on to the dreams that you have today because you, all, you have no idea how impactful these potential dreams can be as you get older, wiser, and more experienced in the world. I just finished writing a book on this subject the book is called Joy, Inc., How We Built a Workplace People Love. And to think about entrepreneurship, to think about business, and to think about writing a book about these things, and end up at a place where I could put on the cover of the book the words joy and love, well, I have to say that's a pretty special place for me. <coughs> um, it's intriguing to me that for some reason, the first country to sign up for a translation of this book is China. So there's going to be a Chinese version of Joy Inc. Uh, my publisher, Penguin Random House, told me that's very unusual for China to be the first to sign up for a translation. So I'm guessing that there's some reason that a book about joy and love means something special to the Chinese. I'm not sure why. Perhaps some of you can tell me later. <coughs> As you contemplate the businesses, the ideas that you have, and you look at your business plans, if you think about what you're contemplating in your business, uh, what your product is, who you're going to serve, how much it's going to cost to produce, how much you think you can sell it for, all the things that go into the normal kind of business plan or business model canvas, I want you also, as you look into the future, because I'm assuming that you are thinking about success, to think about the things that perhaps are not yet in your business plan. Things like culture, purpose, your team. How are you going to build the company that surrounds this product? And what will go into that? This is the things I talk about in my book. I talk about the culture we built. I talk about the purpose of our company. We we picked a purpose that was pretty lofty. I, I think it's always good to have a big goal for whatever it is you're trying to do. For us, our goal was to end human suffering in the world as it relates to technology. There's plenty of it out there. We wanted to return joy to one, something we thought was one of the most unique endeavors that mankind has ever undertaken, the invention of software. And those are the things we talk about. Those are the things we dream about. Those are the things we build an entire culture around. I don't know how many of you have gotten to visit our space, but it's only a couple of short blocks from here. I know some of you are coming in a week or so to come visit us. People come from around the planet just to come see our space. We've had almost 2,000 visitors this year alone in 300 separate groups. I think they come to see a space, I think they come to see a process, a methodology, but what they walk away with is a feeling that transcends all of those things. They get to experience a culture. I would encourage you as you think about the businesses that you're contemplating, to think about the culture that you want to build. Now for me, a lot of that thinking, a lot of the thought process that came into this for me came from teachers. Some of them here at this university. Some of them in this very building. I can remember taking computer science classes in Bernie Gallup right here in Angel Hall a long time ago, back in 1970s. 
1979. If you think about what kind of culture you want to build, I would suggest to you that you think about building a culture around purpose. Simon Sinek, who has a great uh, book called Start With Why, talks about the fact that people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. You have to think about the why. For us, that why translates to joy. We wanted to deliver joy to the world through what we did. We wanted it to be external to our organization. Is Menlo a happy place to work? Sure, most of the time it is. But that isn't, that isn't the cultural purpose. That isn't our mission. Our mission is external to our company. Our mission is to bring joy to the people who are going to touch the software that our team is building. We want people to stop us on the sidewalk and thank us for the work that we did. That's where our purpose comes from. I can tell you much of what you do in business has very little to do with money, has very little to do with profit. Those are outcomes. Those are things that keep you sustainable. Those are the things that allow you to come back the next day and do it again. But your purpose is what's, what brings you back here. Your purpose is what brings you, you back to your company. Sure, you're not going to come back day after day if there's no paycheck, if there's no money, if there's no profits, of course. But if there are those things, if your company is working financially, and yet there's no mission or purpose for you, that's often a danger sign for your company. So I would encourage you to think about those things. For us, it translates in so many different aspects of the company we built. It translates to the physical space within which we operate. If you come to Menlo, you see that we're just one big open room. No walls, offices, cubes, or doors, no offices for the CEO. I sit out in the room with everybody else at a simple five-foot table. There's no pretense. There's no focus on titles. The space for us energizes us. It's very important to our culture. We talk about the freedom to learn. I can tell you that the most important thing that you're gaining both through this experience here in this challenge as well as your education here at the University of Michigan is your ability to learn how to learn, to develop a love of learning that will last you a lifetime. That is perhaps the most important thing you can come away from the University of Michigan with, is that love of learning. You have to think about how you're going to build your team. You know, who else are you going to draw in? What other people are you going to partner with in your business? Who are you going to employ? if you need employees for your business? Who are you going to partner with as vendors? And how are you going to work with them? Because all of those things make up your company. If you get past this challenge, if you actually take your idea forward and you start building a business, you're going to realize it is the people's stuff that becomes your biggest challenge. It's not the idea. It's not the markets. It's your customers. It's your employees. It's your suppliers, all the people you are partnering with. You have to learn how to build that team, and you have to be creative in how you do that. We have an interesting interview process at Menlo to bring new people onto our team. We have an interview process where we don't ask any questions of the people interviewing with us. If you want to work at Menlo, you come in, we actually put you to work. We simply watch to see how you do. One of the biggest elements of most business cultures, it's wound up in one simple word, and it's an unfortunate word. It's the word fear. Most organizations manage themselves with fear. Sadly, that fear often ends up robbing your company of its greatest asset, and that's the innovation, the imagination, the creativity, and the innovation of the people who work for you. Because unfortunately, if we manage with fear, it shuts down the best parts of our brain. We start operating <coughs> out of reptile brain, out of the amygdala part of our brain. And we shut down the most interesting parts of our mind. So we need to figure out how to move fear out of an organization. The way we've chosen to do this at Menlo is to get rid of bosses, to get rid of the hierarchy. We don't have an important chart. We don't have a hierarchical structure. We don't have people saying, here's who I report to. Now, just because we've gotten rid of bosses doesn't mean we've gotten rid of leaders. I would suggest to you that your most important capability in growing your team is growing leaders on your team. 
Leaders don't lead because they have authority. Leaders don't lead because they have a big office. Leaders don't lead, lead because they have a big title. Leaders lead because they can influence other people to follow them. You're not much of a leader if you can't draw people to follow you. Even in a startup company, you need to get people to follow you. You do that through leadership, not through bossing people around. Ultimately, you must build quality into whatever it is you want to do. That quality typically is a result of great rigor, of great discipline. Whatever it is you're choosing to do, you must do it with quality. The world will ultimately judge you based on whether you could build quality into your offerings or not. You can survive a little time without quality. You can maybe even survive a long time without quality, but someone will eventually figure that out, and then you'll be cast by the wayside like yesterday's newspapers. One of the best ways to do this is to build alignment into your organization. When I was a young entrepreneur, uh, I, I struggled with one aspect of business. I couldn't figure out this one part of business. It was the business part called marketing. I couldn't figure out marketing to save my life. I couldn't figure out what it was. What did it mean to have a marketing team? You know, a lot of people think about marketing and they think about advertising. They think about ads in magazines or on radio or on television or maybe going to a trade show and having a booth. But what I saw in all the organizations I worked with before is that they would spend a lot of money on marketing and it seemed to have a little long-term effect on the success of that business. There didn't seem to be a straight line correlation between how much money they spent on marketing and what the success was they had in the marketplace. The people who really understood marketing would explain to me, Rich, you just don't understand how marketing works. You have to spend money to make money. And I kept listening to this convinced that perhaps they were right. Perhaps it is, in fact, marketing that I'll never be able to understand. Maybe that's just not how my brain is wired. Maybe it's just too hard. Maybe it requires some kind of cleverness that I can't figure out. But I kept reading. I kept searching. I, I was convinced that there was something fundamentally wrong with the marketing that I had seen going on in the world. And finally, one day, I listened to an audio book about a couple of guys in New York City who said, everything you know about marketing and advertising is wrong. And finally, I get somebody speaking my language about marketing. These are people who've been in the advertising industry for decades, and they were telling me that the way the world of advertising and marketing worked to this day was wrong. And I listened. And for me, it finally made sense. They said the job of marketing is to align the world's outside perception of your firm with your inside reality. Now, most companies wouldn't want to do that. Most companies wouldn't want to expose how they are on the inside to how they are on the outside, how they're perceived by the outside world. But this made sense to me. When I tell this to people, they look at me and say, Rich, we never want to expose our company's inside reality to the world. It's, it's terrible. I say, well, then you have to work on your inside reality. Because ultimately, marketing done right is almost effortless. Marketing done right says you are exposing your heart for your mission, your purpose, that thing you do that, that people are buying because they buy what you do, they don't buy why you do it. If you understand why you do what you do, and you can communicate that to the world, you can set yourselves apart like no other company. You know the examples out there of companies that know why they do what they do. We, we all flock to them. We love those kind of companies, and we know the kind of companies that don't know why they do what they do, and we steer away from those companies because we see they perform randomly in the marketplace. They don't produce great quality products that draw people to them. So you have to work on aligning that. And I would say that for any entrepreneur, there are three points you must draw into alignment. That world's outside perception, the inside reality of your company, and the heart of the entrepreneur. Ultimately, if you are the leader of your organization, if you are one of the founders of your company, if you're the one who had the vision originally for the products and services and offerings that you're going to bring to the world, you have to bring 
that heart to your company. Until the world understands your heart, they won't understand your company. Until your team understands your heart, they won't, they won't understand why they're coming to work every day. You have to learn to get that vulnerable with your team to expose why you're doing what you do. So I will leave you with this. As you contemplate your plans, as you get excited about your awards that are going to come, as you take the ideas you have today and change them into something you really want to pursue, or if you come up with a brand new idea later, seek inspiring examples. Look out into the world and find those things that you admire and study them. Learn about what it is that inspires you in those examples. Because ultimately, entrepreneurship is a journey to self. Entrepreneurship is a, a long lifetime journey to figure out why it is you want to do what you do. What is it that makes your heart sing? Because I will tell you, whatever you choose to do, today it might seem easy, it's almost never easy. Entrepreneurship is not about easy. Entrepreneurship is about meaning, about purpose, about producing great value. And that's never easy. It is worthy. It is a worthy goal. And going back to that dream of a 20-year-old, I can tell you I hung on to that dream and I was able to finally achieve it. I didn't start actually pursuing it until I was about 40 years old. I had a 20 years of career in between that further taught me what it was that I really wanted to do in my life. And I don't think I could be doing today what I'm doing today without those intervening 20 years, many of which were very painful. But I can tell you now, it doesn't feel like work anymore to me. It is truly a joyful journey. I wish you joy in your journey. I wish you good luck in your competition today. I know many of you are waiting to hear uh, who wins, who comes in second, third, and fourth place. But know that just having stepped forward into this challenge, just having taken the extra time to produce, pursue something that's meaningful to you, means that you've learned something. Not just about how to do this, not just how to enter a competition or a business model plan, but you've learned something about your heart. You've learned something about what brings joy to you. Thank you very much.